Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Uh, for first of our summer speaker series, uh, um, co-sponsored with the Museum of the Portage. And uh, this summer, as you all know, we're looking at the creative arts of all the unique cultures here at Portage in 1832, uh, which is the year this house was built next door. You know, there were people here who had been here for you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. There were brand newcomers. All these different people groups coming in in the Portage for a lot of different reasons. Um, but you know, one of the common threads you see amongst all these cultures is they're bringing their creative arts with them. And uh, that's something you don't always think about when you think about you know, the weighty history that's going on at this time. So this summer we're focusing on that, his you know, that history of all the different cultural arts, uh, with all the different people here at Portage in 1832. And tonight we're hearing about um, the creative arts of the Hochunk Nation. Uh, you know, one example of creative arts that, which have been here for you know, a lot of generations back in Wisconsin history. Um, and we're excited to be hearing from Josephine Lee, the director of the Hochunk Nation Museum and Cultural Center in Toma. Mm -hmm. uh, um, new, new museum that uh, if you get a chance to get up there, a great museum to go to. Uh, um, so we're looking forward to hearing from you. Center. We opened in 2020 in January and then immediately shut down in March. Um, <laughs> and we had a few issues getting started, but we actually reopened again this March um, with a show of bandolier bags, and that will be up until September. So you all are welcome. Um, we are open Monday through Friday from 8 to 4 30. Um, we are closed this week so I can do things like this and then also have a couple community responsibilities. Also, so when I talk, um, please, if you have questions, just stop me because sometimes I can either rant or I can get very, very lost into some of the details without really explaining it. Um, it could be the academic side, it might just be that I like to tell a story. <laughs> Um, so first off, I am Ho-Chunk and Norwegian. I grew up making um, some Ho-Chunk art, but not really a ton. And so then as an adult in college and afterwards, I really started trying to learn more things because they were needed in the community, but also I needed to do something with my hands. And don't like sitting still. Um, so the first thing that I learned as a high school student was actually how to make yarn belts and how to do baskets. I didn't bring any baskets with me, but there are plenty in the space that you can look at. And when people think about Ho-Chunk art, typically they think about black ash basketry first. And then when people also think about Ho-Chunk, they don't necessarily think about other art forms because they're not always visible. But this right here is a yarn belt, and you can see one in the back in that little display right um, there. And in Ho-Chunk, we call them Che Hee and that is really just referring to the bison hair that were used to weave belts and other straps prior to European contact. So as we interacted more and more with fur traders, Europeans, and Euro-Americans coming into Wisconsin, we had more access to fancy things like wool and dye. And so as um, those interactions increased, we also added an much more vibrancy to our art forms. Um, not to say that there wasn't vibrancy before that, but it is so much easier to dye with an aniline dye or writ dye today than it is to go and actually process your own dye. I don't do that because I don't have time. Um, so the other thing that people think about, and typically those stereotypes are um, beadwork, projectile points, and leather. 
So when people think about Native American art in general, those are the three things that they think of. And um, also black and white pictures. So when I do presentations, and if I was, if I had put together a slideshow, typically what I re prefer to do is I will never show black and white photos of Ho-Chunks because you are not going to be able to break some of those stereotypes in your mind if you don't see people that look like me. Okay. So, with our bandolier bag exhibit that we have up, um, we did use some black and white photos, and the reason we did that within that exhibit is because we actually found the original bags that were in the photos and have them on the wall. So, um, just so this right here is not a Ho-Chunk bandolier bag, but this one is one that my daughter wears. She is seven. Or actually, no, she just turned eight. She's very tiny, so <laughs> this is big on her. But um, what I really like about these bags in general is that with them, there are all kinds of colors, and you don't see those within those black and white photos. And so with Ho-Chunk ones, you typically see whites, pinks, and blues. Um, so there's a little bit, most Ho-Chunk beadwork is gonna have this big white background in it. Similar to this one. Um, I like that you guys just nod along. That's very helpful. <laughs> Whenever, are you ready? Well, I wanted to know what is the purpose of that bag. Okay, so Ho Chunks, um, in the past we had a really good relationship with the French. So French fur traders um, typically would marry into Ho Chunk families. That's how you get the names like Decora and Paquette. So some of them that you will see within the exhibit space here and outside. As our relationships grew and as they developed over time um, and influence of cultures came in, ho Chunks started making bandolier bags. And they were also made by some of the other tribes within the Great Lakes region, and you see them actually all over the East Coast. But within the Great Lakes region itself, we made them in honor of our relationship with the French. Most bandolier bags, or about half of them, are actual bags, so this one has a pouch on it. The other half are just decorative panels. Yes? You said that was not a whole chunk bag. It is not. Um, is it some other nation? Yes. Um, I believe this one is the nominee. Um, with ho chunk bags and most ho chunk artwork, everything is very symmetrical. We believe that in our art forms, that everything should be dual sided. So it represents the male and the female side. You will never, if you see pieces that don't have that symmetry within it, usually there will be somebody that goes, hmm, I wonder who made that. <laughs> <laughs> um, or as my uh, favorite teacher once said, she goes, you must have too much time on your hands. <laughs> so typically you will see things that are mirrored on both sides. So this part down here on the bag is kind of mirrored, but even with this, you can see that there's two different colors right here, and that doesn't usually happen for ho chunk ones. I have a question. Are yeah. that, is that finger weaving, or is, how do you weave that? This? Yeah. This is on a loom. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah, so. On the loom, okay. A big loom like this, actually, um, most of them are done on wider ones. They're box looms. It's a really, really creative term for a box with strings attached to it. Um, this is actually a piece that my husband is working on. He is a disabled vet who I needed to keep busy as well. So there's a trend here. If you need to do something, you're going to start making art. Um, and so he is working on this piece. But typically for bags like this, Ho-Chunk ones would have a single strap that's made out of a single piece of loomed work, like this. And then um, the wider strip on the bottom. I have a question. So all these designs, I mean, I can't, even just drawing them out on paper, it's hard to 
imagine how you would visualize those. Were, are those designs something that uh, um, somebody has in their head and they're just putting beads on a string to uh, um, make it, or is it something planned out? I mean, today maybe it's different than in the past, but... It's a bit of both. Okay. Um, so I do a lot of youth programming, and one of the things that I talk about with the Ho-Chunk youth is that Ho-Chunks, in order to make this type of artwork, so beadwork specifically, but also things like this woven bag, it requires a lot of math. Um, so it is a ton of counting, so constant counting in order to make sure that your pattern is going to match up and line up exactly. Because if, let's see, if one of these beads is off here within this pattern, you're no longer going to have the same shape. Wow. So. Yeah, that, do those, those designs also have kind of, do those designs kind of come down through the Porcupine built uh, quill beadwork or kind of designs previously, or how? Uh, yeah. Um, um, so prior to beads entering into the Great Lakes, most of our artwork was done with things that were more readily accessible. So that is quill work. I didn't bring any with me, but have some small pieces. Um, and quill work can be done in a number of different ways. So some is done with a wrapping technique. You hold it in one hand, wrap it around, grab another quill, wrap. It is time consuming. Again, um, all of which good artwork takes is a ton and ton of patience. So the quill work with the wrapping takes a lot of patience. Um, there are some older forms that um, are actually loom woven. I've only seen one piece in my life that was in a collection in Wyoming and it was held by a private owner and then on display for four months and that was it. So the one instance that I've seen, there might be others out there, but they're older and fragile. Um, a lot of Ho-Chunk artwork prior to colonization was more geometric. And it is just because it's easier to do with the types of artwork that we were creating at that time. But as um, part of it through colonization, through the interaction with the Europeans and Euro Americans coming in, more um, floral shapes started taking effect or taking um, root here. So you could see things like this one with stars and some little flowers in here. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that actually started coming up more and more through boarding schools. So I don't know if anybody ever saw those. Actually, I don't know, I should just point the examples in here actually. So there are little samplers that were taught in schools to young girls of how to embroider. So little stitches to make your alphabet and flowers, some of those things came into our beadwork. So oftentimes, at least, again, I'm just going to encourage you, I'm going to keep talking about the exhibit that's on display, so you guys have to come see it. Um, so we have a number of floral bags, so they are beadwork bags like this, but they are stitched on, so they're not a loom, um, they are stitched onto the bag. And those ones look very similar to the sampler patterns. So, oftentimes, Ho-Chunks and other tribes have taken things that come into our communities and then repurposed them in ways that are much more indigenous or much more Ho-Chunk looking. Um, didn't come from the U.S., but they were trade items. And with Ho-Chunks, we took them and made them into really, really beautiful pieces of clothing. Wow. <clears throat> and so all of the pieces up 
here are things that either I have made or I purchased from other individuals. Um, this is one of my skirts. I did not make this one, but a Ho Chunk woman did. Is, is the pattern hand sewn on? on the this machine? one is with the machine. Okay. I don't know many people that hand stitch them anymore just mm -hmm. because it takes so much time. Yeah. Um, this one is also done with the machine. And this one has more visible plants. So some of the artwork or the ribbon work itself, you can see um, different plants from the region. I am not always great about identifying these ones, but in the applique that I do myself, I typically pick out specific plants and will draw them out and then make them more aesthetically pleasing and group them together. So the panels are fabric and then a wide like satin ribbon? Yeah. Um, so in the past, they were all done with satin ribbon. Um, today, I know people buy large bolts and yards of bridal satin. That way they can make them as wide or skinny as they want them. But whatever you can find. Are these worn for ceremonial occasions or every day? Um, this, these ones I wear if I'm going to dance at a powwow. So not necessarily ceremonial, but more celebratory. Um, if you have ever seen those photos that were taken by Van Shake in the 1900s in Blackover, or the pictures by H.H. H. Bennett, oftentimes those pictures were taken with women or men dressed head to toe in pretty much everything that they had. Those ones were um, like a calling card, a marriage card, so a family might say, this person is eligible for marriage. This is everything that we are going to give this prospective family. And look how nice we've decorated them. Look how great we are able to provide for this child so that we can also provide to your family. Um, yeah, so typically within those, a woman would wear a skirt like this. Um, sometimes they were actually just blankets. Today we only make them as skirts because we don't want any mishaps. Um, today I would have a yarn belt similar to the one that I showed, and a ton and ton of necklaces. So, if I'm dancing, I would wear one of these. And then I would also wear this one. And at some point, when it feels like I can't hold my head up anymore, then I would stop. Um, and all of that, again, is just a well signifier for either myself or my family. Um, I'm making a big mess up here now. So the beat you're ready? Yeah, did you want to hold them? So they make a sound, right? They do. They're dancing, yeah. Um, so this is just five strands. weren't as easily accessible, but wampum beads were. So they're still the same shape and the same idea. The long, those long ones are wampum? Were, were they used to be. In the little bit out of bone? Or? No, um, wampum is a shell. Okay. Um, it's typically found on the East Coast. Um, so, again, a lot of the items that came within our community also were heavily traded for. And the further away you can get items from, the more wealth your family has. So what's the process of making those, those tubular bone beads? Um, 
I don't really know. I know like generally that you have to cut down the shell and then drill the actual hole through it, but I wouldn't be able to do it or <laughs> there are people that are experts at all kinds of things and that is not my area. Um, typically I do weaving, I do sewing and some beadwork. Can you guys imagine dancing for 10 minutes straight with that on? <laughs> so when you got married, did you uh, go to a wear one of those dresses? And, no. Um, no, I didn't. I had a very beautiful white lace dress. Okay. I picked it out and I loved it. Um, <laughs> But we did joke a lot between our families. We never made an agreement of whether or not we would exchange gifts, but um, one of my uncles, when my husband proposed, did tell him that he owed our family 10 horses. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I kind of missed that. Um, these bags themselves, when they were first made and um, more commonly made, are worth the same amount as a horse. So, my husband started purchasing and finding bags like this. Um, I don't think he's going to hand them over to my mom anytime soon, but um, there are other things that also happen within those relationships. So part of that was all, um, what he could provide to our family, which is work. So anytime my dad needs woodcut, he calls my husband. Any time that honestly, my dad wants to borrow a trailer, he comes to our house, picks it up. Um, so there's a lot of reciprocal relationships that are built through those marriages and those agreements, but not just the items that are given. How are the functional nature of some of these artworks? So uh, you showed that uh, the yarn bag. I know that in the past, you know, those have been art art forms and functional and maybe both. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what I was told is that prior to the 1880s, these types of bags were more common within our communities. Um, black ash basketry really picked up within our communities in the 1880s. Um, does anybody have an idea of why that might be? So. Partially. No. Um, so starting in 1832, we were pushed out of Wisconsin at a very rapid pace, so there was no stability within our communities. So it is much harder to make a basket from start to finish um, when you are constantly on the move. But items like this that you can pick up and carry with you are much easier to create and to continue to make if, even as you are moving along. For black ash basketry, first you have to go into the swamp. That is the best place that you can find a tree. Um, from what I know is that about one in every seven trees is actually suitable for making a basket. So that you wanted a demonstration piece that you can show? Um, sure. I mean, I can just kind of have everybody turn around in their seat, too. <laughs> Even better. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as you're doing that, first you have to find your perfect tree, cut it down. Um, from what I learned from my teacher was that you wanted a tree that had absolutely no knots or branches for the first 12 feet. So about one in every seven if you are lucky. There you go. So, once you cut your tree down, then you have to remove all the bark from that tree. That's another hour. Depends on how fast your workers are. Um, then you get the fun task of actually removing the splints from the tree. 
So in order to do that, you take the back of an axe or a mallet and pound very steadily up and down the log. So move in one direction, don't go the other way. Don't hit it too hard because you will make little divots in the wood. But what you're doing is pushing out the water from the tree and it causes the layers to separate. It takes a lot more time to create these. So by the 1880s, Ho-Chunks um, were able to work. They forced the Wisconsin state government into allowing us to purchase our land back. And so then we had stable homes. So um, there's a really fantastic book that just came out by Steve Kanchowitz. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so, 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 so good. <laughs> yes. Um, which talks a lot about the ways that Ho Chunks used attorneys and the um, state of Wisconsin's push for citizens of the state to our advantage to purchase homesteads and to have our families stay within the state without the threat of removal. What was that? What years were those? Um, 1872, 73, um, was the first time that Hotels were able to purchase a homestead. So, uh, about almost 50 years of constant push and threat. Um, so officially there were seven removals from the state. Um, more likely there were a minimum of 11, and it depends on who was leading the campaign and what military force was in the area. Um, oftentimes there are also vigilantes who decided to take things into their own hands as well. So, 1880s, we see a lot more items being made within our communities, and you also, that is when you're going to see the most um, and yeah, that's when you're going to see the most Ho-Chunk items starting, so 1880s to present. It was much harder to find things earlier than that that weren't, um, weren't destroyed or just worn out. So was the labor from, did the women do all of it, or did the men do some of the harder or tedious? Both. Both. Um, so, again, I'll just talk about my husband. Um, when we were dating, I thought that I found somebody who was able to take care of an ash log for me. He, he cannot. He does not have the patience for it. Um, <laughs> so he started and he's like, well, I think I can do this faster. And just <laughs> So we had to take things away from him and he's no longer allowed to touch the log. So I had to do it myself. Um, the people that I learned from were women who also mostly took care of the logs themselves, but had others that they also relied on. I know that for my great-grandmother, she would pick the logs out. Her husband would remove all the bark from the logs and hand her the splints so that she could process them. You're always looking for a good partner, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, so, especially for basketry because it is so much work. So I'm assuming the baskets all had different purposes as well. This one has a very unusual top. Um, so this kind of looks like a picnic basket. Um, in the 1900s and um, Great Depression, a lot of Hochung families started making baskets for sale. So you will see from about the 1920s to the 1970s, a ton of baskets were made. And actually, all along the different highways in Wisconsin, there would be family stands. I don't know if anybody remembers those, but um, a lot of families had basket stands that they would have along the sides of the roads in order to make money and income for their families. Um, so you will see different shapes, um, picnic baskets. I have a, one that my great-grandmother made that is a huge laundry basket. So again, that's why you want those 12-foot strips so you can make the giant baskets. Yeah. 
there. Um, I have seen some really beautiful ones as well, like a baby bassinet. Yeah, that might be the more creative or somebody that has too much time. Um, it depends. Uh, and then there are different um, signifiers for the different tribes that made baskets as well. Most, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. With most ho chunk baskets that are square on the bottom, they will have this herringbone shape. Mm -hmm. So that little step pattern that goes down it, that is typically indicative of a ho chunk made basket. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that my basket teacher told me was that ho chunk baskets are much more utilitarian. So she didn't use those words, but they're made to be used. And so you don't see a ton of decorative pieces on them. Um, with Oneida baskets in particular, you will see things, I don't know what they're called in English, they're like little curly cues all over the place. Um, there, it's easier this way. Um, so she <laughs> specifically told me that Contracts don't have time for that. That's it's just a waste of materials. <laughs> um, because it it does take a lot of time to make all of those really precise little little points. Um, you might see them here and there on the edges of ho chunk baskets. Um, you'll see them as feet to make the basket stand, but you're not going to see them on the entire wall of the basket. When they're when they come off the log, how soon do they have to use it so it can bend? I mean, do they start when it's green yet, uh, or some not totally green, but some sap in it? Yeah. Um. So you can use them at any point once they're processed. I have some that again my great grandmother had, so they're about fifty years old that I've been able to use. Oh. Um, the way that it works is that they are dried out, so they're not very flexible once they're dry. But you can soak them again, and then you can start to move. Oh, them. Okay. But it's easier if you get it, if you can do it right away. Yeah. But it just depends on how much time you have. I have two little kids at home that <laughs> don't allow me to do anything. Um, and they're also very, very helpful. <laughs> yeah. So was birch ever used as a material for baskets? <clears throat> um, you'll see them sometimes, not this type of basket, not like the big woven pieces, but you might see them kind of sewn together as like a tray in a carrier. Um, as tourism started coming into Wisconsin, you see a lot of birch bark canoes being made, especially in the Dells area. Again, those tourists really like to buy those things, and it makes a lot of good money for families. Um, there are, I don't see many people making them within our community today. I do know at least one person that made one this weekend, but um, you don't see it as. How about carved wooden art? Uh, you know, like you hear about uh, one of the Ho-Chunk people who was here in the 1830s, with, his name was Wooden Ladle. Uh, um, you have any background on those? Yeah, so um, you reminded me that I left a pile of things at home. Um, <laughs> so I was originally planning to bring in some carved um, pipe stems that my husband had made, as well as some wooden bowls. Um, so wooden bowls are really common for us to continue. We still use them within our communities as uh, for serving food and to eat out of. The same with the wooden spoons. Um, today it is much easier to use a lathe to make those. It's much faster. That's what my husband uses. But I do know there are a couple people that will still carve things fully by hand with the little rounded knife. I cut myself with one and I never want to do that again. So um, it, 
is really impressive when you can see those things out there. I do know um, there's one man near Black River who does these really beautiful, intricate wooden spoons with um, animals carved onto the ends. Um, I didn't think to bring an example. No, so so are the critters carved onto the ends, is that a, uh, like a, would that relate to clans or is that just art for art's sake or? It depends. Okay. <laughs> um, so that person really likes to just make different animals and um, to challenge himself. Um, I do know that sometimes people will make items with a specific clan in mind and they might get it to send it or keep it for themselves, but it depends. Okay. One more question about those spoons. I, I, see it, I see those every now and then in museum collections. They have such a wide, um, oftentimes have such a wide um, spoon itself on them. Is that design reflecting something back further in history or is that a design preference? Uh, um, you know. So when you're going in for your soup and you have like a big chunk of potatoes or meat in there, do you want like the little tiny spoon? <laughs> Or you want the big one, right? You want the big wide spoon because then you can grab everything. And it's much easier to grab more things out with the wider piece. Um, those ones still will have like a little bit of a group within them so that it'll hold some of the soup as well as keep everything contained so you can move it from one bowl to another or from your pot to the bowl. Um, yeah? Off the Indian baskets, what are the handles made of? Um, so these ones are still made of um, ash, so they're more of the core pieces, they're like the hardwood piece of the log. Um, I don't know many people that still make the swing handle basket handles, um, so there's one in that case there, it's a three piece part. Um, so that handle is a large piece here, and usually it's fed back through itself into the ears, which are the swing piece. Um, I know generally how they're made, so you have to steam the wood or get it wet and bend it very carefully. If you bend it too fast, or without um, the right amount of pressure, it will either snap or it won't go to the shape that you want. Yeah. A few years ago, we had um, Bill Quackenbush did a class on Indian flutes and um, started out with this piece of wood and by the end of the week, just beautiful. Uh, Indian flute. Is there a certain type of wood that they use for Indian flutes, or can any type of wood be used? You know, I think like I've that? only seen like cedar or pines. I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head if other types of wood have been used, but I know those two are a little bit softer, mm -hmm. so it's easier to carve into. Oh. Mm -hmm. back to the um, like botany designs like what types of local plants do you or others incorporate into your art I'm just I love plants so. okay um so I should have put this on the point uh, one of my favorites to use is bleeding hearts they're my favorite flower oh. I think they're so pretty so I tend to make very stylized versions of those so I have a piece um for my daughter's apple pay that I made with bleeding hearts and that's another more fancy <laughs> filigree off the sides. But um, I, again, I like flowers and I like ferns. So those are typically the ones that I use. Um, others, it, again, it depends on the family. So some families will pass down applique patterns within their family. So they might have a specific family applique that is only for that family. Others don't. Um, I met a woman a few weeks ago who only used her family patterns and 
when she was in her 50s and was finally using a pattern that didn't belong to her family. So mm -hmm. she was, she had to ask somebody else how to draw it out. And it, it was beautiful what she came up with, but she just, you know, it just depends on the person. For sure. Do some of the motifs in Ho Chunk art uh, relate back to, um, you know, oral stories or things like that? Yes. Um, so I am not the person to explain some of that. Um, I can just say yes. Um, there are there are other patterns that are widely known and widely utilized through the Great Lakes. One is um, called an otter track. So you can see it in this bag here. Um, it's this little piece here with the two diamonds or three diamonds and then a longer piece there. Um, is also sorry that sounds horrible um it's also here i think we could probably spend a lot of time talking about all of those but um yeah so in This one's called a pache. Um, it is this very long piece. Um, I have been told, and I don't know if it's always true, it depends on your source. Um, this one sometimes has theories that I don't always know if I believe or not. But um, one of the people that I spoke to believed that this piece originated from bourbon strap. So when you were carrying a child on your back or a basket, this original piece would have gone from the forehead down around the burden. I don't know if it's true, but um, the way that they are worn today is typically tied on the back of the neck and hangs down. So it's if you're dancing at a powwow or dressing up with that, again, it, down from the back. In photos, and I've seen now more today, is women will move them to the front so that they are visible and people can see them, but typically they were worn down the back. So, everything changes over time um, because people also will use this stitch for other things like earrings. So these ones were made by a woman from Tomo. She was one of my favorite bead workers. And um, it's the same style of beadwork. Um, this is a woven piece. Every single piece of, or every single bead is put on one at a time. So I know you had asked a little bit before about whether or not you had to plan out your beadwork or just wing it. Um, there are some people who are talented and smart enough so that they can string all of their beads onto their threads ahead of time. I am not one of those. I have to count it out every single time. I usually make a mistake, have to take it all out and then recount and recount again. But um, the woman that had made this one was one of those incredible people that knew every single row off the top of her head mm -hmm. and was able to put all of her beads on ahead of time and then she could make this entire thing in a week. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. I have been working on one for three years. <laughs> <laughs> and I am... <laughs> it might be one of those projects that I hand down to somebody when they're older. <laughs> yeah. I want to draw people's 
still teaching these traditional arts? Yes. Great question. So I, um, thank you. And part of what I do is try to find different artists within our community to teach classes so that one, I don't have to teach them because again, I'm not the greatest. But two, I think it's really important for us to find the talented people within our communities and celebrate them, but also find people that are willing to mentor new artists. And so um, within the work that we've done at the museum, we typically try to find those that are willing to teach and to mentor. And what I found is that about one out of every 20 people that take a class will actually continue making and really good. Yeah. So what are the types of classes that you've been able to find people to do? Um, so let's see, two weeks ago we held a quill working class. Um, we are hoping to do an applique class with our ribbon work. In a couple weeks I have to find some free time to bring in some people to do that, but we have all the supplies ready to go. Um, we have done, we did Pendleton jackets, mm -hmm. so not necessarily a traditional form of artwork, but I still think it's great to be able to utilize the same skills and to challenge yourself to learn something new and make something new. Yeah? I was curious, do you have families that traditionally are noted for that? In other words, within your whole chunk where here for that pair, where they kind of, that's part of their tradition of passing on the artwork from the B2Bs or what's the thinking? Yeah, so um, there were a ton of families that were known for basket work. Mm -hmm. um, the White Eagles, um, there is a woman, um, actually Wittenberg area as a whole is really known for basketry work. Mm -hmm. And the baskets from that area are really distinctive because they are super colorful. Um, so again, my instructor always told me that too much color was too much time on your hands. But the, the artists in Wittenberg have really done incredible work there. So the colors are distinctively Ho-Chunk. I don't know how to describe how they are distinctively Ho-Chunk, but they are. Um, as well as the shapes and the styles that they make. Thank you. Yeah. Did you mention the museum that you were um, involved with? Now, is your employment by your uh, state, state funding, or is it through? Um, it's through the tribe. Um, so I am. I work for the museum as an employee of the Ho Chunk Nation. So the museum is government controlled in that sense. Um, the majority of our classes are actually provided for through donations, um, which is kind of a unique structure. And then the other thing that makes our museum different is that we showcase items from the community. So not, not everything is from our collection itself, but they are community sourced items that then go back to the community once they are done on display. Where is your museum in Tulsa? It's right on Main Street. It's 1108 Superior Avenue. It's a building that was built in 1891. It's pretty old. It's, um, it was renovated <coughs> as a gallery space before we purchased it, which is really, really nice. Um, so we have, I think, 15-foot ceiling, so we can do very, very large shows. I guess hired me. Let's see here. So, in terms of other classes, because we have the Band of Your Bag show up on display, I am hoping that we will do some form of loom work class. So, with Ho Chunk Bags, um, did them on a loom, but again, more complicated. Um, so there is typically a heddle piece in here. So rather than just having a single row of thread going up and down, so that's your warp, 
Um, there are two, so even with our beadwork on the loom, it is woven. And it will stay nice and together for a much longer period of time. Because as you guys held that one piece of beadwork, it's really heavy, right? Mm -hmm. So beads in general are heavy, and so it is easier, at least through Ho Chunk perspective, that if you're going to have it, it should last. So the heddle pieces tend to last a lot longer than the single loom. So, so these small like seed beads, they came in with like the French traders, mm -hmm. and so, and then the Ho Chunk just started doing art with them. Like, I wonder how it kind of progressed. So we have beads not made of glass prior to Europeans. Um, they're primarily made out of clay or shell. Um, we did have very large lead mines that we operated. So there's some lead material in our communities or within archaeological sites that you'll find. And then copper. There's a very large copper um, source in the Great Lakes. Um, so again, most of those beads were made of copper. Um, shell. Much bigger work, right? Yes. Um, I think, let's see, so the majority of glass beads that came in through the trade were either very tiny or very large. Um, they're probably about mid-size compared to those. I can see these better. My eyes are getting older, and I like working with this size bead. But, yeah, so, um, once they came in, then it was, well, this is much easier to use. You don't have to make it. You don't have to actually trade as hard to get the items or things like that. So we're and the threads? Um, So were the for threading on each of those beads, I can't imagine threading a needle to go up through beads. Was it threading beads on with a needle or is it threading on threading them on by putting the bead over the thread? It depends. Um, so this type here, the okay, the side stitch, we don't use a needle for that. So it is threading on each bead to your without the needle why it's taking me three years to get so far. Um, but with pieces like this, then there is a needle, I think. This is a loom needle, or loom beadwork needle. It is much larger than one I would use. I don't particularly like this kind, but the garment behind you that's hanging there? Um, so this is a um, beaded shirt that's my husband's. Um, I had the panels commissioned by somebody else because I don't, I don't have enough time. Um, so I used a traditional ho-chunk pattern a little bit of Potawatomi things, but mostly Ho-Chunk in order to make an older style shirt. Um, for some of, um, so again, I talked a little bit about status pieces. This is one of them. I like to joke that women must not take care of their partners as much as they're not working as hard to um, to show that we need to take care of them. <laughs> so um, I told my husband that he finally earned this. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a shirt he's worn it. Um, he only wore it once, finally, on Memorial Day for 
a powwow, but I've made him ribbon shirts and they just sit in the closet. So, yeah. I mean, it's hard to wear things like this on a day to day basis. I think that it is, um, at least I'm very lucky that I get to wear what I want, but I know that there are. When I was growing up, there were comments like, that, why are you dressing like an Indian? Um, so things have changed, which is great. Um, but this is also very heavy, and it's hot. Mm -hmm. And I like jeans and t-shirts. <laughs> Um, no, it's a Pendleton blanket, it's a Pendleton wool in Oldman, Oregon, um, said earlier, but kind of a problematic company, but they make really, really pretty blankets, and it's warm. Um, and I was given it as a cat. Like, yeah. Did the whole Chuck woman make, a, like, star quilts? Um. Like they do today. Okay. Yeah. Um, my coworker actually bought a very large quilter and it's now in the museum. So we are also hoping that we may be able to offer a quilting class because it is very expensive to get things quilted. I have no idea. Um, Yeah, I just had never made a quilt or thought to pay somebody to do the quilting on the top, but it's now something that we can offer through the museum, which is great. Yeah. What do you see as the future of Ho-Chunk art? You know, it's a, it's adapted through all different types of history. It's uh, you know still going on a lot of traditional things, new things coming in. Yeah. Um, um, so my favorite Ho-Chunk artist currently is a man named Henry Payer. He is from Winnebago in Nebraska. So I talked a little bit about Ho-Chunk removal. So one of the final pushes of removing Ho-Chunks from Wisconsin was South Dakota was actually to Nebraska. Or first to South Dakota, the conditions were terrible. So we sought refuge with relatives in Nebraska. Um, so half of our community is there. The other half here, federal government recognizes us as two different tribes, but we are the same people, same language, interconnected families. Um, Henry does um, mixed media collage work. So it is painting with found materials, different photos added in. Um, typically, I bring one with me again. <laughs> I was in a rush today. Um, so he does some really, really incredible work. And if I get the chance, I tell people to purchase from him because I really like to see that re-envisioning of what Ho-Chunk artwork can be and what it looks like as we move forward. Uh, going back to the wood, um, a totem pole, is that, would you say that's something that uh, was originated from, you know, the, you, you know, your people, or do you think it was, it's just an Americanized? It is from the Northwest Coast, mm -hmm. so they are not from this region. Okay. Um, there are um, pole carvers in pretty much all along the British Columbia coast mm -hmm. into Alaska, some of northern Washington, but not here. Okay. Um, you do see some around the Dells. Yeah. Um, part of that is because there was um, a lot of artists brought in. So native artists from all over the country were brought in. I think they stayed with some of my relatives, um, but it was all 
to promote tourism. Yeah. Um, but they are, they tend to become pieces of like Americana and what people think of when they think of American Indians within the US. And it's just kind of become one of those um, stereotypical images. many tribes in Wisconsin, because you all have your own unique styles. Did the different tribes trade beads, etc., garments with each other, mm -hmm. even though the other tribe's motif, if you will, was on it? Yes. Um, so often within, at least, like, so I can, if you have anything. I can show you all of this. Um, so within some of those photos, you actually see Potawatomi getting their bags on individuals, or you might see Ojibwe ones, um, because there was so much trading. And one of my favorite stories is that if you ever go to like our Memorial Day Pow or Labor Day, and you will um, see sometimes in the mornings they play a game called Moccasin. Um, they will sing a song, it's called a horse stealing song. The reason is, is that Ho Chunks, as we would go up north to trade for bandolier bags, we would steal horses along the way. <laughs> so then we would take the stolen horse, we would trade it to the Ojibwe, and then come back home with the bags. And the Ojibwe's would get caught with the stolen horses. <laughs> so we have songs about it. <laughs> <laughs> so did arts have, di so, you know, like Anne said, all, all different tribes in Wisconsin have all different unique types of arts. Um, do you see that art plays different roles in the different tribes, or is it kind of, you know, do some tribes go heavily toward art as art itself, or um, other tribes maybe art as a functional thing, or you know, are there different kind of values within art in different, in different cultures in Wisconsin, or? I think that's really tough to answer because I can only say from a Ho-Chunk perspective. Sure. Um, I do know that some pieces of art are more easily recognizable, and you will see a lot more um, just pieces around of Ojibwe art, and part of that is because they're tribes. Um, there are many different readily recognized Ojibwe tribes, at least within the state, but also through Minnesota, Michigan, and then all of Canada. So there are just more numbers of people making art. So you will see more pieces out in the world. So I can't tell you whether or not they value art more. I think it's really is individual. Yeah, but I, I was taught that um, you know, cultures that have more time or ease of living created more art. And so that's the theory of, of like the totem poles in the Northwest, mm -hmm. is that there was a, you know, milder climate, lots of seafood, and they had time to create these totem poles. And I mean, you've mentioned time a couple times. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's not so much how, you, how much a culture values art, but the kind of time they have. Right. Because I think inspiration's all around. For, you know, for all, any, all of us, but um, the time right. to do it. Um, yeah, I think that's exactly it. So prior to, again, prior to colonization, most Ho-Chunk villages were very large. We were agriculturalists. So again, we had more time to do pieces. Um, but we have been this under the system of colonization for over 500 years, so there is not as much time. Mm -hmm. We are also in a post-industrial world that is kind of on the failing edge of capitalism, so again, there's no time for this. But like for yourself growing up, um, what was your mother then? Um, ho -chunk? Yeah. So then, was it just were you fully immersed in like creating things and, and the culture and all that? No. Um, so I was born on the East Coast. My parents both worked for the Census Bureau. Um, my dad is very, very Norwegian. Um, 
So I just didn't throw out around a lot of things. That's kind of why I mentioned that I didn't start making items until I was in high school. The other part of that is I know my children can't sit still. I They are just like me. I could not sit still as a child long enough to make things. Um, and my mom worked a lot. So there just wasn't as much learning within my home at that point in time. We moved to Wisconsin when I was nine, and then I had much more um, interaction with relatives who were able to teach me. Um, but even then, um, with my first belt, my aunt taught me when I was 17. I made it halfway through, made a bunch of mistakes, and she took it away from me and said, you're done. So, um, so it took me a little bit longer to learn things. Um, same, I think around the same time I had learned how to make my first basket. And I specifically remember going, I'm never going to do this again. Why do I need to learn this? <laughs> because it, it was hard. And it took me a very long time to learn how to be patient enough to sit and put in the work that needed to be done for this. Um, so that it didn't look sloppy or didn't fall apart or, or I didn't have to take it all apart. <laughs> so it sounds like we have high standards. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how many elder ho chunks you have, but the ones in my life have set a really high bar. <laughs> But like you said, too, one mistake and the whole thing starts to just go haywire. At least with the beaver. And I would assume with the basketry also. Yeah. Um, and again, I think that's part of that teaching of patience is that once you see the mistake, it is going to drive you crazy. So you might as well just take it all apart and fix it so that you don't have to stare at that and nobody else can see that either. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.